On March 14, 2001, members of the Phoenix Fire Department responded to a call for help. Initially, it was a routine incident, a debris fire on the exterior of a business. When it was all over, the incident was anything but routine. A Phoenix firefighter lost his life in that fire, and the lives of those who were on the scene that day remain changed forever. March 14th for the, for the fire department was probably one of the worst days that you can, you can have. Um, before that, it had been probably 20 years since we had lost somebody in an actual structure fire. Um, Brett was a, a member of Engine 14, and he was going to 35th Avenue and McDowell to see if anybody was in the building uh, and control a fire. And unfortunately, Brett never had the opportunity to come home. An arsonist set the fire at the back of the Southwest supermarket at 35th Avenue and McDowell Road at about 5 in the afternoon. Engine companies arrived and knocked the fire down. They put out the fire they could see. Unfortunate wind conditions pushed the fire inside the building through an open doorway, and it made its way into what the construction industry and the fire service call concealed spaces, spaces inside walls and ceilings that can't be seen but can allow fire to travel and burn undetected. When more fire units arrived, they proceeded to evacuate the buildings and look for more fire. Very little smoke when they first, when Engine 14 first um, went in there. They, they got it all clear. Where, um, that means that they saw that there, nobody was in the building within, uh, you know, 30 seconds. So you could, you could see that they went right down each row and they could see all the way to the back of the uh, grocery store. By the time the fire showed itself again, it had grown. The fire had spread in those concealed spaces across the span of the roof of the 27,000 square foot supermarket. Firefighters inside the store found a visible fire in a storage room to the rear and were fighting to put it out but didn't know how bad the fire was above them. Firefighter Brett Tarver from Engine 14 was inside the burning building with the rest of his four-person crew trying to get control of the fire when he realized he was running low on air. The captain of his crew ordered them all to leave the building together immediately. Brett Tarver started toward the exit in the zero visibility conditions. He never came out. Minutes later, Brett declared a mayday over the fire department radio system. It is a very rarely used and very serious term used by a firefighter in distress. He said he was out of air and breathing smoke. He couldn't find his way out. A rapid intervention rescue team was sent into the burning building to rescue firefighter Tarver. The conditions inside were horrible. By the time we started to enter, um, I would say about two feet inside the door, you couldn't, it was just total blackness. You couldn't see anything. The contents of the store shelves had toppled to the ground. The heat from the flames was intense and the smoke was blinding. Two feet inside the door, I can't see a, a thing and supermarkets all are different. They've got counters and um, customer service booths and produce aisles with things in the middle of those. So I really didn't know exactly how it was laid out. I didn't know if I was going down aisles or if I was going against the aisles. Um, so the hose line is all I had to go on. The fire hose can help lead a rescue team to a downed firefighter. And equally important, it will lead the rescuers out of the building to safety. Never leave it. Don't ever, not even for a second, leave it. You get, put your hands off that hose line. You follow that hose line all the way in, especially in those conditions, in that big of an occupancy. It would be at least stretching the truth if, if I were to say that, give, that, that day our emotions weren't strapped, weren't stressed to the max. Um, I've been on fire grounds where, where people have gotten lost before. I've been on fire grounds where firefighters have gotten in trouble. I have never been on a firefighter or on a fire ground where we've had a firefighter in trouble and we send firefighters in to, to help that firefighter and they get in trouble. That was a unique experience for us. The rescue effort was nothing short of heroic. Many fellow firefighters risked their lives to save them, their coworker, and their friend. Brett Tarver was removed from the burning building and taken to a hospital. Life-saving efforts at the scene and the hospital were unsuccessful. The Phoenix Fire Department had lost one of its own. What happened next was something appropriately called recovery. The department wanted to know as much as it could about the incident in order to prevent anything like it from happening again. 
It launched an investigation, and it held a mirror in front of itself to see what, if anything, needed to be changed to protect the lives of its people. And its philosophy is to make any tragic loss of this kind the last. And the way to do that is to learn from the experience. The next morning, um, the senior staff, and specifically Chief Brunacini, went to the site. We had to break the fire chief's heart by telling him this is where we lost one of our own. He made a decision that we would take all of our crews through that fire within the next three days. That was done. Every member of the Phoenix Fire Department, as well as the surrounding cities, went through that building within the next three days. We began to recreate what had happened. Nothing was hidden about the incident. The public heard the details, Brett's family heard the details, and the firefighters who were and were not working that day heard the details. And most importantly, the firefighters who were there were heard by the people doing the investigation. More than 100 interviews were conducted with those who had first-hand knowledge about the incident. It was truly an open book. As the information was gathered, it became clear that changes needed to be made. It was estimated that 95% of the firefighting practices done on March 14th were correct. Yet 5% of the way the Phoenix Fire Department does business on a commercial structure fire needed to change. The systems that we had, for example, at Southwest Supermarkets have saved, served us, and probably saved us too, very well in the past. It's just that things change. You, you learn things. In other words, we can't keep the world, we, you can't keep the world still. It's going to change. And what causes organizations to become sort of dull and then mediocre and then obsolete and then ineffective is that they stop looking outside the system and, and, they, and they, they stop saying, how do we match what's going on today and not throw the baby out with the bath? And I, I, think, I think the spirit that we have in, throughout the whole fire department is, is, is let's try it. We try something and it works, we keep doing it. If it doesn't work, we try something else. We go back to what worked before. I mean, it's really not very complicated. What the department learned is that it needed to spend more time doing drills in real buildings that more closely simulate the hazards of large commercial structures. Fortunately for the citizens, the department's members don't get many opportunities to fight fires in large buildings. They get a lot of opportunities to attack fires in homes and other small structures, but the firefighting tactics can be vastly different from a bowling alley or a movie theater. Buildings in Phoenix that were scheduled for demolition were found and leased for the special training. The scenarios were the same at each location, to rescue lost firefighters who were low on air. Inch one on the scene of the medium sized structure of the working fire on the east side. Inch one is laying a line to the east, taking a handline in for search and rescue and fire attack. Inch one is assuming command and offensive strategy. Two firefighters were placed inside the buildings. One was conscious and the other was not. They called a mayday on the radio saying they were lost inside the burning building. A rescue crew outside was immediately mobilized and sent in to find the lost firefighters. Over the course of the year following the 35th Avenue incident, more than 200 drills were conducted. Firefighters from fire departments all over the valley participated. Firefighters who experienced the drill now completely understood how difficult it was to get Brett Tarver out of that supermarket. I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, I really know now what you went through. Um, it was dark. We, on the drills, we actually blacked out our, their masks, and uh, we made it really tough. They had to go up over a lot of items, um, use the rescue loops, you know, stay on the hose lines, and uh, I think we all realize now how, what a difficult job it's going to be if one of us gets lost. We always thought in the past that there was safety in twos, that, that if you sent two people in together, that, that one of them would always be able to take care of the other one. That's not true. I'm going to pass to the back this way. Can you get Jimmy? I'm going to pass to the back this way. Okay. All right, let me get Tim one and we'll go that way. 
that was a storage room in a uh, grocery store that all the product had fallen on the floor. We had to lift a, a 300 pound man or 260 pounds plus his gear up off the ground and carry him out and that just didn't happen. It really takes about 12, we found out it takes about 12 firefighters to rescue every one firefighter that's down. I think that we've, through our training, have more or less uh, proven that the old school of thought that if you and I go into a building together and you go down, that I can pull you out. That simply is not true. And, and, and as far as I know, that has never been written before March 14th. It's a really interesting phenomenon that uh, firefighters will, when everybody's running out of a burning building, firefighters are running in. Well, that's the kind of people we hire, and that's what we train them to do. I mean, that's, that's the gist of what we're about, is going into burning buildings and hostile environment. So now you already know that that's the kind of people you're dealing with. Now take, uh, basically, in the camaraderie and, and the, the, the family of our unit, of, the, of our firefighters group here in Phoenix, and we say one of our brothers or sisters is down in that building. Well, you're going to have a hell of a time keeping people out of there because everybody's willing to go in and lay down their life to get that person, that other firefighter, if you will. It's not acceptable to, to die on a fire. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, that's the heroics of the job and all that stuff, and that's not true. It's, it's not acceptable. Um, I didn't come on this job to die on the job. I want to retire. I want to be just like any other citizen out there that, you know, enjoys his retirement. Um, we risk our lives, you know, to save lives, but we don't risk it all to save property or something that's already dead. Um, Brett was talking on the radio. Um, I'm going to do everything that I can to get him out of there. And I, I, I feel personally that I did everything I could to get him out. It just didn't happen. But it's not acceptable to die on the job, no. We've really taken a real hard look at what, a, what we call a May Day is when a firefighter is down or a firefighter's in trouble on the fire ground. We've taken a real hard look at what that May Day does to the fire ground itself. Um, that's a big issue, and it's a hard one to deal with because you're dealing with people. You're dealing with, with basically, you're dealing with family members. It takes an, a, a lot of discipline, a lot of training to not let your emotions take over. If there's a more stressful, more emotionally draining experience than to deal with a lost, trapped, or downed firefighter, and, and one who particularly loses his life on the fire ground, I don't know what it is. Good lessons have come from the fire. Firefighters have gotten a renewed respect for having a round-trip ticket when they enter a building. They know how critical time is. They take air in with them on their backs, but when that air bottle runs out, the human instinct is to breathe, no matter how bad the air is on the other side of their mask. The smoke is a killer. Once your bottle is empty, um, and that uh, you have a face mask on and it sucks to your face um, that's the worst feeling in the world I mean you know you can't get any more air out of that bottle it's like when you're underneath water and that's the best I can describe it and, and, you know, and you're out of breath and you're going to the surface of, of a pool even and you're panicking a little bit and that, that's the feeling you get Let's see what we got for air. The drills help drive home the seriousness of running out of air. Another lesson, the unique value of special cameras called thermal imaging cameras. The cameras actually detect differences in heat in front of their lenses, so rescuers can see victims through blinding smoke. Without the cameras, searching has to be done by touch. Had we had the thermal imaging camera that day, that 20 or 25 minutes to find a fire that's extend, extended into a hidden spot, or a hidden space into a large commercial building. If we'd have had crews in with thermal imaging cameras, we would have been able to identify this, where, that, where that fire was earlier. So many lessons were learned and shared among the firefighting community. And the impact of Brett Tarver's death is being felt far away from the intersection of McDowell Road and 35th Avenue in Phoenix. What I want to take away from it, you know, Brett died, but Brett died 
and, and he's going to kind of help us out. I mean, we're now more aware of what we need to do when, when a firefighter calls a mayday. And I, I think that's all come from Brett, and that's what Brett's giving back to us right now. If you look at what firefighters do, we, we had better always operate with a big dose of humility. Is that what we're doing is we're taking on nature. Nature wanted that building to burn down, and it did. And they call them natural laws. They don't call them natural suggestions. And, 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 and what you're doing is you're getting in front of a natural law when you go into a fire. That's a pretty difficult position to put a human being in. Well, we do it all the time. We have exceptional human beings. We have, I think, a terrific system. We're in a great city that provides good resources to us. Uh, I think we connect with each other very well. But when it's all said and done, nature, Mother Nature could care less about that. She's in that building, and it's burning, and it's just chemistry and physics. And the only thing that understands is water. After a lot of hard work and thoughtful preparation, a detailed report was compiled in less than a year of the 35th Avenue fire. It not only tells what happened, but explains how the Phoenix Fire Department has been changed forever by the event. Brett shouldn't die in vain on this. In other words, we ought to be better for the experience, as tragic as it was, losing a member of your family. But that, that I think, I think Brett, Brett's death will save a lot of firefighters' lives, not only here, but probably across the country. It is dedicated to the memory of firefighter Brett Tarver and is available to the fire service for the asking.